Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. There are 48 animals that we had to put down. Those animals included one wolf, six black bears, two grizzly bears, nine male lions, eight lionesses, one baboon, three mountain lions, and 18 tigers. I remember it all happening on a Wednesday evening at about 10 till 7 uh, is when I received the first phone call. We became international news by the next morning. It was just a disaster waiting to happen. Zanesville is a sleepy town in Muskingum County, Ohio, with a population of just over 25,000 people. Until 2011, Zanesville was best known for its Y Bridge and many beautiful parks. It's one of the last places in the world you would expect to find an exotic pet owner with so many animals. But on one fateful day, the worst example of exotic pet ownership brought Zanesville to the attention of the world. Zanesville is a very small, agricultural, very family-oriented community. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what everybody's doing. It's a small town. One of these small town residents was lifelong inhabitant Terry Thompson, a decorated Vietnam War veteran whose main role had been as a machine gunner on a Huey helicopter. His wife, Marion, was an avid horse rider and a local school teacher. Many locals knew the Thompsons kept exotic animals, but Terry was better known as the man who flew a light plane under the Y Bridge. A notorious hoarder whose property was scattered with old cars and a dangerous mix of guns and wild exotic animals. Terry had drawn attention to himself many times over the years with his unusual behavior. Local police sergeant Todd Canaval has vivid recollections of Terry Thompson. We had dealt with him off and on. He had just been released from prison just a few days before this incident on a firearms charge. We had dealt with him in the past also about uh, the animals, just checking on their welfare and the safety of the public as far as the containment systems that uh, he provided them and such. He had several animals then, 70 some I believe. He had tigers, he had lions, he had black bears, he had grizzly bears, he had different apes. One time he had camels, numerous horses, uh, there was just animals everywhere. In the garage, there was a couple of tiger cages. There was a bedroom where a, a mountain lion, I think, lived. Um, there was monkeys in the basement in a cage. Yeah, Terry was different. Terry always kind of pushed the envelope, but Terry was Terry. I, he was never really disrespectful to me or anything. I was always concerned that either Terry or Marion would be attacked by the animals. I realized they had a good rapport with the animals, but they're still wild animals and something would trigger him. I figured maybe someday we would go up there and find one of them severely injured or killed. The sergeant's fear was realized on the evening of October 18, 2011. Terry's notoriety was about to extend beyond the small community of Zanesville. As the day drew to a close, 
It is believed that he cut open the cages of more than 50 of his wild animals, setting them free before taking his own life. Senator Troy Balderson was born and bred in Zanesville and had been a member of the Ohio House of Representatives since 2009. This incident was a trigger for him to amend the legislation surrounding exotic pet ownership in Ohio. About a mile down the road that evening, there was a, a tournament soccer game going on. There could have been a lot of tragedy, and, and there wasn't. For the most part, no one was injured. That was one of the biggest accomplishments that I feel that, we, that came out of the situation. The next thing I saw was a black figure. It turned out it was a bear. Sam Kopchak is a retired school teacher and lived next door to Terry. That evening, he was out in his own yard attending his own horse, Red, when he saw Terry's horses acting strangely. I saw the horses that were over there. It's probably about 60 horses, I estimate, that they had. They were going around a circle. And I said, well, they're not supposed to do that. Something's going on, you know. Then Sam saw something even more out of the ordinary. I actually got Red up there by the corner. And he walked down through here, and I just felt like something was looking at me. And I kind of turned to the left, and big male African lion, he came down. This is about the spot he was uh, sitting. He just sat down right there, and just kind of, you know, like that. And uh, I just kept on going, and I never looked back till I got down to the white fence where my barn. And then after I was down by my barn, he was pacing back and forth on the fence. As you can see, this is like a seven strand. Bob, not a bob wire, just a smooth wire. And if he wanted to leap over that, he was big enough that he could leap over that fence. What Sam soon realized was that the lion was just the beginning of what was about to unfold. So I actually saw like six animals. The original bear and then the uh, lion, the male lion and the, and the female lion, and the, another bear and uh, the wolf went by and the tigers. Yeah, I think I just seen one. It looked like a jaguar or a wolf or something. I received a call that uh, some of the animals were out. We weren't sure to the extent of, of the situation, but I was requested to come to the scene. When we arrived, uh, we were advised by one of the patrol sergeants that he had been up in the, the compound area uh, looking for Terry or Marion and had uh, seen a body laying out in a field. And that was our first priority, determine who it was and if they were injured or deceased. We were first approached by, uh, I believe it was two tigers come out of a barn towards us. And as they rushed the truck, we were forced to dispatch them. Then we arrived in the area of where the body was and it was quite apparent whoever it was was deceased. There was a white uh, tiger chewing on him. About that time, we were advised that there was two cats ready to exit the compound area on the south side of the property. So we had to go over there and dispatch those animals. I didn't know how many were out, but once we got up there, I had made contact with the sheriff that appeared that everything had been turned loose. And I mean, there was bears, there was tigers, there's lions running everywhere. It was a huge concern because it was later in the evening, you know, if it got dark, the only thing securing that property is just a regular barbed wire fence like you would have for cattle or whatever. You know, these animals would have easily cleared that. And in a short time, they'd have been in populated areas and injuring, you know, humans. There was some that had escaped the perimeter, but we had set up officers along the perimeter to contain that. I discussed with the sheriff what our situation was. There was no other option except to dispatch the animals. We started engaging the animals at different distances. Some were shot 30 to 50, 70 yards away, but then it came to where we had to go to the barn areas and that because they were in there. And yeah, we had one lioness come at us. Uh, we ended up having to shoot her and she was stopped probably three feet from us when she finally went down. Most of us had AR-15 shooting the 223 round. I was concerned that maybe there wasn't enough power, but after we engaged a few animals and saw that, you know, the, the rifle was doing its job, then I felt a little better that, you know, we, we could be safe. 
It was a coordinated effort to try to keep everything safe and, and contained. Sam became an unwitting bystander to a grisly scene. I saw the deputies pull in, and my first thing was, well, there's going to take more than two deputies to take care of this, because if, if all those animals are out. And uh, I saw a truck, and there were several, probably four deputies on the back with, with the guns, and uh, they drove back there. And within a few minutes, I could hear shooting. It just sounded like a big fireworks display. It just kept on. It seemed like it went on forever. I saw them going across the field, just like hunters, you know, but the gap between them with their guns, 49 animals that they killed, and one missing, and six that were in the house. So it was 56 total animals that were there. It was quickly determined that it would have been impossible to control all these wild animals using tranquilizers. And the decision to use live ammunition undoubtedly saved human lives. To the best of my knowledge, there was one tiger left. And the veterinarian there, I think her name was Wolf, she went over and got a perfect shot with a tranquilizer, hitting perfectly where she wanted to. I mean, she, I guess, made the determination how much to give him, you know, how big he was. And he was in the weeds and so forth, and he come immediately charging out of there. And if the deputies weren't there, he'd have probably got her. They had to shoot it. When it comes down to a situation like that, I realize there, uh, you know, the animals have rights, but humans have more. And you just, you, you couldn't justify uh, risking human life for, for the animals. They had to be somewhat scared. They were out of their containment systems, uh, running loose. You just didn't know how they were going to react. You could kind of surmise that he had let them go. But it wasn't until, you know, the investigation was completed later that we were pretty much, we, we knew that's what had happened. You know, even if you'd found him in some other containment systems, he cut the fences so that you couldn't recontain him. I, I'm glad it turned out that no one got hurt. To have that many animals loose, we were just very lucky that we caught it when we did. You're not ready for something like that. Uh, we had to deal with what we had to do, and that's why I think they've come out with legislation on this kind of, uh, practice, it's just, it's not feasible, uh, safety for the public or for the animals. Immediately following the incident, Ohio ultimately banned the ownership of exotic animals and their transportation across state lines. We don't want to see these animals lose their lives over something like this. They are wild. I mean, the, these animals are not domesticated. They are wild animals. That's what I kept trying to focus on. That's what I did focus on when we did this legislation. They're wild. We knew something needed to be done. Um, the administration knew that something needed to be done, and we had to stand up and, and, and do the right thing for the state of Ohio. And that's what, you know, I had to make that decision also. Challenging as I knew it was going to be, I knew there was going to be a lot of negative feedback from taking on a piece of legislation like this. You know, before I started doing this legislation, I did travel the state of Ohio and going to sanctuaries that, you know, that's the challenging part. There were people that had sanctuaries that were doing it respectfully. You wanted to look at both sides of it, but you also had to take the responsibility to make the right judgment, to set the mind of we weren't going to do this. We weren't going to allow you to have wild animals without certain restrictions that you had to abide by. We had a facility at the Department of Ag that was built out there that took in the people that could not find places for their wild animals. They could take them to the Department of Ag. Um, we stored them there until we could find some place to go. Um, there are good places out there with the facilities that are, are capable of, of handling these animals. And, um, you know, it's some place for these owners can, that can take their animals that they can still have a relationship with. They can still go visit. They can still go feed. I think that was important to a lot of them. So, you know, it's still there and always will be there, you know, in your mind about it. I'm just so thankful that nobody got hurt, and it's terrible that he had to die. It's a very sad thing. All those animals are buried back there along the, the, the road where they buried them. I mean, they dug a big, put them all in there. You see, they laid them all. See, that was the bad picture on the internet that made people irate because all those animals, when you saw that, that scene, and the, the sheriff was very upset. They don't know who took those pictures, and they put them out. But I mean, that, the, but they had to put them lay them out so they would know they had them all. And the, and the caretaker was the one, like I said, that was counting the heads and telling them, well, 
you know, we do have them all or whatever with it, but that made it a terrible scene too, because you see the, see all of them lying there, you know, like that. So it wasn't too nice to see. But they're beautiful animals, and you hate to see them get killed, but if you got a choice between the animals and the people, you gotta save the people, and that's what they did. Exotic pets take all shapes and forms, and often the owners have an incredible and very special bond with their animals. And this is undeniably the case with Lisa. Oh, baby money. You see this little itty bitty baby, as cute as can be. But that little itty bitty baby is gonna tear you apart. At no point should you ever feel complacent with a monkey you've never met before. This monkey was only after the owner's camera, but it's an intense reminder this is a wild animal. If you buy a monkey, be prepared that you are gonna get attacked. Lisa and Mugwai have been friends for 24 years, a commitment that's incredibly rewarding, but also very demanding. Unless you're an educated monkey owner, you're in for a disaster. Every single monkey bites, and it's gonna bite you, no matter what you do. So, you know, a monkey has to be tamed, and then it can be trained. So it's a process that you have to go through. And it takes a lot of taming to become a good monkey. When you have a good monkey, it's easy to make new friends. But if your monkey is a little wild, it may bite strangers. Many vets will only examine a monkey when it's sedated to avoid any unwelcome wounds. When these animals hit six years old and start going through puberty, they can become wild, vicious, dangerous animals. You know, the training that they've often learned, the domestication they've learned at that early age, that pretty much goes out the window, and you're dealing with literally a whole different animal. Monkeys frequent the tourist circuit in Thailand, and they may seem super cute, but you always need to keep your guard up and pay attention to what may become aggressive behavior. Don't be deceived by their so-called friendly antics. These monkeys are wild. A lot of these animals carry diseases that are communicable to people. They're called zoonotic diseases. And a zoonotic disease is any disease that can be transferred from pet or animal to person. And some of the diseases are quite serious. Non-human primates carry herpes and monkeypox and Ebola. So again, if you don't know what you're doing, sanitation, care, so forth, then that's something that you can take on or a family member or a friend who's visiting because the disease is now spread around your home. You have to step back and look at all that's involved, do your research and education, depending on the pet and what's involved. The take home here is never should it be taken lightly owning an exotic pet, regardless of the size or the species. We still have monkeys in the United States that are carrying disease. Probably only a third out of the 40,000 monkeys out there and growing each and every day, they are not vaccinated. We've been vaccinating these monkeys for years and years and years. And we do a serology test to screen everything that imaginable that they could possibly have. This isn't a pet for someone keen on owning a low maintenance animal. Monkeys can be a handful. She's very calm though. She'll sit and she'll watch a movie with you, have some popcorn. She doesn't get into a lot of things. She used to when she was uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so over the age of of 12 to 13, then they really start to be a part of your life. Capuchin monkeys reach maturity around five years, at which point their personality can become even more demanding and potentially aggressive. If you're the prime carer, you really need a lot of training to make sure the relationship stays on track. She is eight pounds. So that eight pounds coming at you full force. That's a lot of monkey there. Really, seriously, it's a lot of monkey. She's, she's strong. A monkey on the attack 
is a situation to be avoided at all costs. However, for Lisa, this inherent wild animal instinct saved her life. They're very smart, yes. I was attacked. I came home from work and I was attacked in my garage and my monkey saved my life. A man had grabbed me from behind. Inside my house on the second floor, they have their two monkey rooms. And if it wasn't for all four of them that came downstairs and attacked him, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today. All I gotta do is give her one sign. And it's uh, she becomes the wild animal that everyone sees. I love her to pieces. We are two people that are inseparable. Capuchins are most notably renowned as pets of organ grinders and were in fact introduced as exotic pets from their home territories of Central and Northern South America. These mischievous rascals certainly kept the audience entertained. Plus, they had the ability to carry a cup around to collect money. From this, their popularity grew for those wanting an unusual pet. There's pros and cons where exotic pets are concerned because the, our biggest problem is the caretakers and owners that own them don't have the education that they need. Lisa has trained around three to 4,000 monkeys, often referred to as the monkey whisperer. Lisa is the go-to person if your monkey is misbehaving. When I take her to train other monkeys, she helps. You know, it's great for the other monkeys to see that they can actually be loved, that they can be touched without being hurt, or, you know, the mistakes that these owners make by using gloves and using weapons and the shock collars and things like that. I mean, it's still going on today. Owning a monkey is a commitment for up to 30 years or more. While capuchins are the most intelligent of the New World monkeys, in the human world, they are like toddlers. But that's how naive these people are. They think that they're humans and they can treat them as humans. But they're wild animals. They have to have a habitat. Not a little tiny birdcage, a habitat. So they can be free. They can jump, they can climb, they can do, they have things to do all the time. Muggy's surrounded by so many. You know, they need their own kind to be able to communicate, to socialize, to groom each other. That is a healthy animal in captivity. I have a huge facility. A lot of people have come to my door and dropped their monkeys off. A lot of them came that way. And all the monkeys that are there have either been injured, they've been rescued, or they've been dropped off. You have to be a very experienced person to have a primate. It's a huge responsibility. I do believe that any of the larger monkeys should not be kept as, quote, pets. But I do not call them pets, I call them companions. These devoted companions may need a lot of ongoing training, but just like humans, they are always capable of a little monkey business. I studied animals, I studied monkeys, their data, the brain waves, their anatomy. And because they're so human, you open her up, she's just like me. You know, so it's so beautiful, a creature that can do anything that we can do. I mean, she started my van and her and Madeline ran it into my house in the garage. So this is how smart they really are. You know, you cannot turn your back. Mugwai may be a troublemaker at times, but she also knows when to be well-behaved, especially when there's the opportunity to go toy shopping for her birthday. But first, a quick sketch as a thank you gift. After all, Muggy is a very polite little monkey and doesn't want to turn up to any event empty-handed. Her name is Mugwai. I'm, I'm Mugwai. Hi, Mugwai. Happy birthday. <laughs> She'll be 24. Oh, 24, wow. that's amazing. What? This for you. She painted it. Oh, are you kidding me? That is awesome. <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, nice. Thank you. That is really cool. She painted it. Ron may not have a monkey in his store every day, but he's certainly keen to help Muggy find the best present she's ever had. Yeah, we're good. That's a shopping. <laughs> you like that one? No, no interest in that one. No? Okay. No. 
When it comes to shopping, Muggy is a girl who knows what she wants and certainly loves all the attention. Hey! Wanna check it out? Come here! Come here! Oh, Aww, look at the little princess in her chair! <laughs> here you are! Something like this. Try as she might, Muggy's not listening to Ron's sales pitch for these toys. Up, let's go. Up, up. All right. Right here, it's like a little Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> what do you think, sweetie? Oh my goodness. Looks like Ron has finally ticked all the boxes. Thrill Seeker Yellow doesn't seem to hold as much appeal. However, the scooter looks like fun. Okay, hang on. Got a good grip of us? Ready? Mm. You got a steer. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> After all that adventure, it's time for a quick pit stop. Nerds are your favorite? <gasps> oh. What do you think of those, baby? Her ultimate favorite candy. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, yeah. Her the texture and the creation yeah, yeah. and everything. I got a few more for you, Bubba. There's a lot of controversy oh, yeah. about owning a monkey. Not all monkeys have a great reputation, and many certainly aren't as well behaved as Mugwot. But it seems the key is all about good parenting. All right, sweetie, your total is $64.94. You see it right there? <laughs> yeah, that's going to be for your new car, your new Jeep. What do you think about that? You going to be a journey girl? You can go on journeys with mama? <laughs> all right. She's like, yeah. Yum yums. It comes down to <laughs> how well they are taken care of, and that is the big picture. I get judged every single day. But what it comes down to, when they lose control of that monkey, who do they call? You can call me names. You can say whatever you want to say. But at the end, you're going to be begging for my help. You know, and, and am I gonna turn that person away because they were, they were crappy to me? No, no, I'm gonna help because it, it does not matter. I don't care about them. I care about those animals. That's what really matters to me. The Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park in Oklahoma hosts some of the country's most interesting big cats and is home to star personality Joe Exotic. Originally, I was born in Kansas, I grew up in Wyoming. I moved to Texas, was there 16 years, and I ended up here uh, when my brother got killed in 1997. Uh, we built this facility as a memorial to him because his dream was to go to Africa. I've been doing this 32 years now. Started actually almost 16 years before I moved here. And that's what me and my brother had was an exotic pet store. And, and that was where I got my first lion, uh, 16 years before we started it. I have built myself my own prison. Because you can't leave here. I went to Walmart three years ago, uh, came back and, and one of my staff members lost an arm. Hey, this is Bobby at the DW Zoo. Uh -huh. I need a helicopter. I've got an employee that was attacked by a tiger. 
and these hurt bad. I need, is it care flight, I guess? Uh, we have to go back here. Okay. That's something that I never, ever want to see again. So I've never left here since. It's a potentially fatal attraction, but Joe's captivation with predatory animals has persisted. Animals and it has always been a fascination to me. Um, I, I picked up sick animals when I was little and pretended I was a vet, nursed them back to health, so it's just kind of uh, something I've been born with. Ah, uh, the showman side. Uh, you know, it's just because I, I, I say what most people are thinking and they're too scared to, to say it. And uh, I have fun. Uh, anything I do, you can give me a bowl of Cheerios and a glass of milk and I can, I can motorboat around that bowl all day long. Entertaining, I, I love to entertain. Cause I saw Tiger. Joe's love of entertaining has led him to pursue many careers in the spotlight, which have seen him adopt the stage name of Joe Exotic. Most recently, he's combined his passion for exotic animals with his successful country music career. Singing is kind of an escape from reality to me, and, and I can write songs about uh, how I feel, the way people act, uh, you know, uh, misery, happiness. And, and that's just something that I use for an escape. Sure, he's a little eccentric, but he does have ambition. In 2016, he ran for president against Donald Trump. I laid in bed one day during the presidential election, and, you know, common people like you and I never get heard. I, I, that's a fact. You can vote all day long. You can send a letter. You'll never get a response. And if you do, it's a, it's a form letter. Uh, so I laid in bed one night. I was like, how in the hell do I ever have a voice? Uh, woke up the next morning, filled out my federal papers, signed up to run for president. And, you know, I learned more in 11 months of running for president of the United States than I did in 12 years of high school. So. We gave him a run for the money. You know, people are like, you, you lost. I, I didn't lose anything. A, a hundred million people know who I am. Uh, I got my voice out there. I got my opinions out there. I, I think we won a lot. Give your money away. Joe's first love, however, has and always will be his animals. The first time I rescued a tiger, and I still have her. She's 27 years old. That was my first real connection. And when you help something, there's a much different connection there than if you buy something and try and make it a pet. Taking unwanted abused animals, I have a whole lot more sense of being able to work with them. I'm like their savior, and they know that. We are here to educate the world, entertain people, and take care of animals. I don't like the word sanctuary. We're a zoo, we're open to the public. We buy, sell, breed, take in unwanted animals. You know, there's everything here. We have 450 plus animals. We have everything from Michael Jackson's alligators to, to Steve Martin's chimpanzees to just John Doe's tiger out of his backyard. We have a, a diverse family of animals of all kinds and people of all kinds. People ask me every day, well, you know, how do you train these tigers? I don't train my tigers. I walk among my tigers. And, and if they want to be petted, we pet. If they want to be loved on, we love. If they're laying over in, in the shade or the sun and they have their ears back and they just want to be left alone, they're left alone. The American Veterinary Medical Foundation states that once in captivity, no wild or exotic animal species should be re-released into the environment. For many of Joe's animals, his zoo is their final home, and he believes this is the safest place for them. The only safe place for an animal in the United States is in a cage, in a zoo or somebody's yard that can properly care for them. Unfortunately, society in today's world 
won't allow even a rehabilitated animal to be turned back loose in a wild. We just had a bear in Oklahoma a couple months ago, a wild bear, come up on a lady's porch in town. I said, what do they do? They kill it. You know, they, they hunt it down and kill it because it came into town. And this is the most important thing that, that I hope anybody gets out of anything that I'm saying is animals in the wild have no rights, none whatsoever. We trash our oceans. We, we, we build cities in, in our wetlands and our, and our mountains. We took away their habitat. But if you properly care for and you don't take away from the wild, I believe any animal that's bred in captivity, you have a right to own as long as you take care of it. While animals like the black bear are native to the states, other animals such as lions and tigers have been imported making their care and welfare once they arrive a hot topic. The placing of exotic animals in wildlife sanctuaries and the motivation behind doing so is a highly contentious issue. The federal government of the United States, and this is what we're working on right now, has tigers and lions on our Federal Endangered Species Act. Okay. Our Endangered Species Act was designed in 1972 to protect native species of our lands. Tigers, lions, kinkajous, orangutans have no business on our endangered species list. Okay, but put them on our endangered species list, what that has done is, you know, private citizens are not allowed to possess, own, breed, interstate commerce, which means sell across state lines or anything like that. Two months ago, you saw online that there's too many tigers in America. A month later, we put them on the federal endangered species list. In the meantime, they ship a circus tiger in from Peru to America and, and 13 lions from another country. Somebody's got to make up their damn mind. Uh, have we got too many in America? Do they belong on the, on the endangered species list in America? And why are we shipping them in? Because it makes good rescue stories. We rescued a tiger from Peru, and we need to raise $33,000 to care for this damn thing. And they euthanized it six months later because the money train ran out. As yet, there's no central database or requirements for exotic animal owners to record and report on the disposal of animal bodies. The recommendation is for the bodies to be cremated to ensure animal parts don't find their way onto the black market. Between 2000 and 2004, more than $100 million was made from the sale of wild animal imports, making it a lucrative business. Everyone to speak his mind, Joe considers it's the money rather than the care and protection of animals that drives many sanctuary owners in the U.S. It is a controversial opinion, and whether he is right or not is yet to be determined. There's 2,800 registered tigers in America. There's less than 3,000 in the wild. Every sanctuary in this country is the same one. It has nothing to do with helping animals. All you have to do is take the board of directors' names and pull up their tax records of what property they own. And I'll guarantee you, every one of them lives in over a $800,000 house. This ain't about animals. This is about money. Understand this. If you raise money for animals at a particular nonprofit facility, it better be spent for them animals. See, here in America, you have to be licensed by the United States Department of Agriculture and be inspected to make sure that you're taking care of everything right and following protocols and vet care and all that stuff. Only if you're open to the public. Now, if you're a sanctuary that doesn't exhibit and you're close to the public, God only knows what's going on behind them walls. Okay, and see, that's another problem with, with most of these sanctuaries and these organizations is they want animals in sanctuaries with no contact. How would you like to be thrown in jail and never touched or never loved on? As much as Joe loves his animals, they remain at heart wild and unpredictable creatures.
Some of Joe's most dangerous residents are his bears, and he knows all too well the potential risk of keeping these unpredictable animals in close proximity to humans. I've not had good encounters with bears. We actually have uh, four grizzlies here and, and three black bears. They're just as personable as any other animal. Ozzy, who is our largest grizzly bear, uh, will sit up and give you a high five and, and French kiss you and everything else. Uh, Ozzy came from Kansas uh, and back in the early 2000s when Kaylee Hildebrand was killed by a tiger getting her senior picture taken. Uh, Kansas panicked and passed some laws and made it illegal for private owners to have animals, and that's where Ozzy arrived to do us from. It was was a, a private owner who just had some exotic animals, and this bear loved that guy. Uh, and when he arrived here, he was probably six feet tall, standing up on his back two feet, and this guy walked him around the park just like it was a dog. He is 100% lovable, as long as that fence is there. That is as much his security blanket as it is for our safety. <laughs> wow, oh, no. <laughs> I've been in with him. He's a 100% different bear. He weighs about 1,400 pounds. Uh, you know, during the summertime, they eat less. They lose a little bit of weight. Uh, during the wintertime, they, they eat more and they put it on. Uh, for a Syrian grizzly, he's, he's pretty large. Bears are not as predictable as a lot of animals are, in my opinion. Bears is something that I've, I've really never specialized in working with because they're just so moody. I had a black bear at one time uh, that we raised called Little Bear, and she grew up in the gift shop years ago. And she got out of her enclosure uh, one day and went back to the gift shop and uh, decided to wreak havoc in the gift shop because she was playing. You know, everything on the shelves had to come off the shelves. And I put a harness on her and went to walk her out. And bears are much different than tigers. When they lay their ears down and they do that, you're gonna get bit. Bears may be different to tigers, but that doesn't mean tigers pose any less of a threat to Joe and his team. There's days they don't feel good. There's days they woke up in a bad mood. Like I said, uh, I've built myself my own prison. If people think that you do this because you're getting rich, <laughs> they really need to come work here. <laughs> Uh, you, you can't leave. I wouldn't change it for the world. I have a goal in my life, and that is to be somebody and accomplish something. And that's the way I was raised, and, and that's what I'm gonna do. I saw my brother killed at the age of 32 years old. I buried my first husband here uh, at the age of 32 years old. And, and I'm gonna leave this world leaving my mark. I've dealt with so much death in my life, and life's too short to be a tie to act. So, so my personality is, I, I, I laugh all the time.